Welcome to the University of New South Wales Canberra Australian Naval History podcast series, produced in partnership with the Naval Institute, the Naval Historical Society, the Navy Sea Power Centre and the Submarine Institute. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoy this podcast and return for others in the series. I'm Professor Tom Frey, a former Naval Officer and now Director of the Australian Centre for the Study of Armed Conflict and Society at UNSW Canberra. The Centre hosts the very active Naval Studies Group, so please visit our website. To find us, simply Google Naval Studies Group and UNSW Canberra. Ours will be the first website in the search results. This podcast is the second in a series focusing on the Royal Australian Navy and the Great War of 1914-18. In this program, we focus on the Rebel campaign in late 1914. First, some background. The capture and occupation of Germany's Pacific colonies during the opening six months of the Great War was the newly established Royal Australian Navy's first wartime operation and Australia's first amphibious operation involving both Navy and Army personnel. The operation drew in virtually the entire fleet and saw the new nation suffer its first wartime casualties. The dead included several members of the RAN landing party. Also lost was the submarine AE-1 and her entire crew of 35 men. Although the mission included the capture and occupation of a number of German colonies, the major landing occurred at Rabaul, a deep water port on the northeast coast of the island of New Britain. In history, the Rabaul campaign has been largely overshadowed by the subsequent Sydney Emden engagement off North Keeling Island and the activities of the first Australian Imperial Force and the Dardanelles campaign. But it was an immensely important campaign, as we shall see. To discuss the campaign from both the Australian and the German perspectives, we are indeed fortunate to have with us the distinguished German naval professor, Michael Epkenhans, from the Centre of Military History and Social Sciences of the Bundeswehr. He is an expert on the German Navy in early 20th century and the author of Tirpitz, architect of the German High Seas Fleet. To provide his assessment of the submarine operations, we have Rear Admiral Peter Briggs on the line from his home in the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria. Admiral Briggs represents the Submarine Institute of Australia and has been heavily involved in the project to find the ill-fated submarine AE-1. Commander Greg Swindon from the RAN Sea Power Centre in Canberra is the author of First In, Last Out, The Navy at Gallipoli and HMAS Melbourne, The Forgotten Cruiser. And finally, we have Dr Rob Stevenson of the Australian War Memorial and the author of To Win the Battle, The First Australian Division in the Great War. Gentlemen, thanks for making time to be with us and to talk about this important campaign. Michael, can I begin with you? Can you tell us about the nature of the German presence in the Pacific and Germany's plans in the event that there would be a war with Britain? Well, Germany had occupied quite a few islands here in the Pacific Ocean beginning in the mid-1880s. Some were the results of negotiations with Britain, uh, others were occupied later on also as the result with uh, negotiations with Britain and the Americans like Samoa, and also the Germans bought quite a few islands from, from the Spanish after the Spanish-American War, like the Caroline Islands and the Marianas. And why was that? What, what was their purpose? Well, in, many, it's, it, in the first cases, especially regarding New Guinea and uh, the Bismarck Archipelago, they uh, had been occupied, in the, flag, the flag had followed the trade because German traders had been active in this mm. area. Uh, they had bought plantations and they now needed protection uh, against uh, foreign countries uh, in order to uh, preserve their interests. And um, this is something one always has to keep in mind. Regarding your, the second part of your question, defending these colonies, the, the German Navy was always too small uh, to defend uh, the, the colonies here in this area because the Germans had only a very small cruise, cruiser fleet and the Germans had no interest in uh, defending these with the battleships. It was simply impossible. They started to build uh, in uh, the North Sea. Tirpitz always argued that the, all the German colonies in, in case of war would be defended by beating Britain in the North Sea. This was the hope the Germans had. 
And uh, secondly, one should al always not forget that all powers, colonial powers had agreed in the mid-1880s that a war in Europe should have no impact upon the colonies because such a, w a war then in the colonies might undermine the authority of the white men. And so for Germany, were these important possessions? Were they more symbolic than substance in terms of national interest, would you say? Uh, the, a symbolic, a high symbolic value because they somehow uh, were the proof that Germany had eventually uh, acquired the place in the sun they had always tried to achieve. That was it. So it, there's something, something the, romantic. Yeah, it's a global kind of empire because yes. their possessions in the Pacific. In yeah. the Pacific. Uh, the only real interest the Germans had uh, was the China station because China seemed to be a very promising uh, market and uh, one of those areas where one could really become an important and really wealth, wealthy colonial power like Britain. Mm. China was to become what India uh, somehow was uh, for Britain. Yeah. And Rob, can I ask you, how were the British and the Australians going to deal with whatever they thought was the German threat in the Pacific? Surprisingly enough, Tom, uh, there was actually very little preparation done before the war in terms of contingency planning for dealing with the German colonies. And in fact, it wasn't until the 5th of August, the day after Britain declares war, that a subcommittee of the Committee of Imperial Defence meets and finally decides uh, how we're going to deal with this threat, not only in the Pacific, but worldwide. Um, were they indolent, do you think? I mean, was it, was it just too small, too minor to worry about? Or were they just a bit lazy? No, I think um, a, a little bit of perhaps a little bit of both, um, well that's perhaps being unfair. I think they didn't believe that the colonies were going to become involved in a European war, they were, they were hoping, like the Germans, to keep those separate. Um, and um, that was probably the uh, primary reason, and they just didn't really believe that there was a major threat in the Pacific. The war was going to be won in the North Sea and on the, on the, uh, the, on the plains of France. Um, however, after that meeting, um, suddenly the Navy realised in fact that there was a clear and present danger. Um, Germans possessed these uh, territories, which provided, uh, as you've mentioned, the deep water port in Rabaul, which is regarded as probably the, one of the finest um, mm. uh, bases in the, in the, in the Pacific. Um, and uh, although they, were not, uh, they hadn't prepared them for defence, um, they did provide an opportunity or a place for, for basing uh, the fleets. So as a result of that, um, this committee decides that, in fact, we need to, we need to do something about it. The Admiralty clamours for that. The army, of course, is about to be shipping the BEF off to France, and it says it wants no part of it. So, in fact, the decision is made then that they will then pass this down, and they'll basically subcontract the task. That's how Australia and New Zealand get involved. Um, there was some preliminary talks by uh, Australia and New Zealand in 1912. Um, this was in the, uh, but more in the case of, well, we were, they were looking at trying to uh, build up a combined force that would go and fight in Europe. Peripheral to these discussions was, well, if there is something that happens in the Pacific, then there was an, uh, an agreement that Australia would probably look to taking care of New Guinea and the Kiwis, well, New Zealanders, would look after German Samoa. And so by the end of August 1914, would you say, is there a clear plan? Do they know what they're going to do and when they're going to do it? Absolutely not. No, they're waiting Absolutely for direction. Not. Yep. Absolutely not. They're waiting for direction from Britain um, because this is not a decision they can make. Uh, imp uh, um, imperial strategy uh, runs out of Westminster. Okay, we'll come back to that when we get nearer to the fighting. But Greg Swindon, can I ask you, um, it said that an important <coughs> thing the Australian Navy did was to help break German naval codes. Now, was it important and what bearing might it have had on this campaign towards the end of 1914? Certainly the RAN helped uh, break German codes. The level of importance depends on who you talk to. Uh, obviously, the Australians say it was very important, uh, the British less so. Um, when war broke out, there were a number of German uh, merchant ships in Australian ports. Uh, some of them had radio, some of them didn't. Uh, one of them uh, tried to get out of uh, Port Melbourne, the Fowls, uh, on the morning that uh, war was declared. Uh, didn't quite make it out through uh, uh, the rip uh, before she was stopped by a shot from uh, uh, Fort Nepean and she was brought back into, uh, into uh, Port Melbourne. There was another German uh, merchant ship also interned in Port Melbourne that hadn't got away. Uh, both of those ships had radio or wireless, and there was a belief that somewhere on board the ship uh, were 
was the uh, German Merchant Navy Wireless Code, uh, which was linked to the German Navy Wireless Code. Uh, and the story goes that uh, one of the uh, Royal, Na Royal Australian Navy Reserve officers who was part of the boarding party that had seized these ships uh, believed that the master knew where the, those codes were held and uh, he stayed on board the vessel, waited till it was uh, late at night, watched uh, the master come out of his cabin and go to another room uh, and retrieve those codes and then promptly arrested him uh, armed with a pistol and, and seized those code books. So you say it's a story. Do you think it's got better in the telling? Because it sounds pretty dramatic. It, it does sound fairly dramatic. Uh, I think it's been embellished over the years. But certainly uh, code books were taken from one of the German merchant ships in Australia. They were then handed over to uh, Dr Wheatley, who was an academic at the RAN College located in Geelong at the time. Uh, Wheatley was a mathematician. He was also fluent in German. And over a number of days, he was able to break the German Merchant Navy Code, which obviously was of great assistance to uh, the British war effort. Certainly at that time, though, uh, the German cruiser Magdeburg had been uh, uh, damaged in the Baltic and uh, she'd failed to destroy her um, German Navy codes, which were captured by the Russians, who then promptly handed them over to the British. So suddenly the British had German Navy code, German Merchant Navy code, and by using those two uh, documents, were able to break the code uh, and then continually break the codes uh, from then on. Did the Germans know their codes had been broken? At this stage, no. Uh, they were unaware of that, uh, and certainly there was some information gleaned from a number of the ships that uh, you know, what they were doing and where they were going. There was also um, using the uh, the German Telefunken system, which many of the the warships had. Uh, they were able to uh, find the direction and the distance that those ships were at, uh, simply because of you know the the, uh, the transmissions that they were. Making. And did that make a difference in the latter part of 1914 for the events we're going to discuss in a moment? It did in some respects, but the Germans were also concerned that their transmissions could be uh, uh, received. So uh, the German wireless operators would often turn down the power on their, uh. Uh, on their wireless sets so that it would give the impression that they were further away than they actually were. So there were some countermeasures going so on So there were well. some countermeasures going on, yeah. but they were unaware at that stage that their codes had been compromised. And Peter Briggs, could I ask you, um, the Royal Australian Navy, established in 1911, the fleet arrives in 1913. It's a very young and new Navy. Um, what was the fleet unit that sailed for Rebel, and how effective was it, given the task it was to perform? Yes, uh, the flagship HMAS Australia was a, a battle cruiser, 18,000 tonnes, the late 12 inch guns. Uh, there were three light cruisers. Encounter uh, was a, an earlier ship, having been commissioned in 1905, and then her, uh, Sydney uh, and Melbourne were sister ships, 5,400 tonnes, eight six inch guns. Uh, there were three torpedo boat destroyers. Uh, Warrigo was the uh, flotilla leader with uh, Commander Claude Cumberledge in command and Parramatta and Yarra were sister ships. These were 700 tonne ships, so much smaller, uh, with one four-inch gun. Uh, interestingly, the, the three torpedo boat destroyers are all uh, powered using fuel with, with oil burning boilers and uh, turbine uh, driven main motor, main engine. So that you see the transition from the coal burning battle cruisers and light cruisers to the more modern uh, oil burners. Uh, Protector was a colonial gunboat, 920 tonnes, one eight inch gun uh, was with them. Uh, and then the two submarines, HMAS A1 and A2, uh, that only arrived, they weren't there for the fleet arrival in 1913, they arrived uh, in May 1914, uh, in time to go in the dock and then undock in a hurry and accompany the ships up to Rabaul. And this is a major. The, this is a major force, isn't it? Uh, yes, yeah, it's significant. Uh, quite quite well balanced, uh, you would say, and certainly 
very capable of dealing with uh, any of the German warships uh, had they uh, elected to, uh, to to stand and fight. Um, commanded by Royal Navy commanding officers, uh, so it's a young navy still growing its own uh, officer corps uh, and a mix in, in crewing. Uh, the admiral in charge, uh, Admiral George Patey, Royal Navy, uh, was a gunnery specialist, um, but he is recorded as having quite uh, forward-looking views about submarines, I might say, from the submarinist perspective. He saw them as the fists and combined with aeroplanes as the eye, the naval service uh, appears to be uh, commencing the new era, as he's quoted. He had no submarine specialist on his staff, and when AE-1 went missing, he relied on Lieutenant Stoker, the commanding officer of AE-2, for specialist advice. Do you think it was the force that was perhaps overdone, given the threat they would face, or was it appropriate for the intelligence they had received as to the opposition they might face? Uh, I, well, I, it was clearly the maximum force they could muster, and I think for your first uh, engagement, as it were, it's probably very sensible to, to make sure you're going to win it and, and not uh, divert resources to uh, lower priority tasks. Um, Patey issued two operations orders, one uh, on the 7th of August, with the objective stated as destroying German ships in Simpson Harbour and Machupi, um, and destroying the wireless station at Rabaul. And the second Op Order 3, dated the 8th of September, uh, dealt with the occupation of Rabaul and Herbert Show in New Britain. And do you think the uh, command so it arrangements... Was, it, was a full run, it was a full run evolution, you know, probably set out. And do you think the command arrangements were... Uh, workable, sensible, effective for the kind of mission they are engaged in? Now, it's very interesting to get into the, the signal logs and so on, uh, as we've done in researching the AE-1 situation. Uh, the ships operated on one high-frequency uh, Morse code uh, radio circuit, which dealt with the strategic to the tactical to the mundane, so everything from ordering fuel and, uh, and so on is on that one circuit. Uh, all the ships tended to log the messages, even if they weren't the addressee. So there's quite a good, there's a very good track record of, of what was said and went when. Um, the commander uh, destroyers, uh, Cumberledge in Warrigo, was given charge of the three torpedo boat destroyers and the scouting and patrolling to protect the anchorage uh, and took charge of them. Um, the two submarines were, were seen as uh, like mobile torpedo batteries, I guess, to be used uh, in consort with one of the torpedo boat destroyers to protect the anchorages uh, during the, the daylight hours. So they seem to be uh, relevant, suitable. Um, Bob, you've got something to add on these arrangements yeah, from just, the uh, Army perspective. From, from an Army perspective, or probably, in fact, more a joint perspective, um, the brigade, which I'll talk about in a moment, is actually formed as a joint brigade, first joint brigade that the uh, Navy and, and Army ever form. Um, it's commanded by a soldier. But an interesting uh, initiative that, was, um, that, that occurred is the CO of uh, HMAS Berrimer, which uh, becomes the, the transport that takes the brigade north to Rabaul, um, it's commanded by Captain John Stevenson. Uh, no relative. No relation. No <laughs> relation. Um, and Stevenson is not, only, is not only the CO of Berrimer, but he's also appointed Naval Chief of Staff to uh, Holmes, the Army Commander. So this provides, in fact, the Army Commander, who has very little experience with working with the Navy, um, with an immediate advisor who can advise him on things like shipboard routine, um, naval customs, which you know, can sometimes, Army and Navy customs are a little bit different, so they can cause friction if, if there's not a little bit of give and take. He provides advice on that. And probably even more importantly, uh, later on, he's uh, in a previous life he was CO of Encounter, uh, so he knows a little bit about naval gunfire. And in fact, um, he provide, probably provides the advice to uh, Holmes later on when Encounter fires the RAN's first naval gunfire support mission uh, at Rabaul. Mm. So I think it's, a, it's actually a surprisingly mature uh, command uh, arrangements um, for two 
quite novice services. You have not worked together before, yeah, and clearly. this is very early in the Great War. Absolutely. Uh, Michael, can I ask you, what were the German forces that were around uh, New Guinea, and uh, what was the um, awareness of what the Allies might do uh, among the German commanders? Well, contrary to their African positions, the Germans had no real colonial army or colonial real troops here in this area. They just had small police forces consisting of um, uh, Melanies um, who had been hired by the Germans and a small number of German officials uh, representing uh, the police of the government, and that was all. And um, they were really ill-prepared for, for everything. They had just old rifles. They had only two guns, but no life ammunition. These guns had always been uh, used only to fire salutes uh, when, uh, the, the, to celebrate the emperor's birthday and so on, and all these official occasions, uh, and that was all. Uh, and what they always hoped that the German cruiser squadron would come around from uh, Tsingdao, where its main base was. In China. In China, yeah. and uh, support them, but this did not happen. And uh, when war began, they still hoped that New Guinea would remain neutral as all the other colonies. But this did not happen when uh, and, and they were fully aware of the fact that w uh, war had broken out when the Australians landed in Rabaul uh, in mid-August, destroying the wireless station and all the other things around the telephones. And from then on, they started to prepare for, for a major attack. Uh, and that was all they could do. So even if they'd had the best of plans, there weren't the resources, there, there weren't the people to put up much of a defense. What we, this is true. What we have to keep in mind that these Melanese policemen had no military training at all, and also the Germans. Uh, we have sim just 750 Germans living uh, in New Guinea, uh, that these Germans had, had only very limited military training in Germany. Only a few of them had been members of the Prussian army uh, and served there at least perhaps four or six months, and that was all. So uh, with uh, such a force, you, you you cannot fight back a proper army, however strong it is and however uh, well-equipped or ill-equipped it is and how, however uh, uh, good or bad its training is. Yeah. But it wouldn't have made sense. They could just offer, it was more of a symbolic yeah. value, yeah. nothing else. Yeah. So Rob, how did the Australians raise a force to send to New Guinea and what did they think they were going to do when they arrived? Okay. Um, it's, it's first important to note that um, they were actually operating on two separate chains of command. Uh, Pady is now actually under command of the, uh, of the Admiralty, and so he's responding to them. So he, in fact, even before war is declared, he's steaming north towards Rabaul in search of Spay. Uh, in the meantime, on who the is the who is the uh, sorry the uh, Admiral commanding the German East Asiatic Squadron? Great, thank you. Um, in the meantime, though, the telegram is uh, the telegram is dispatched to Australia, um, seeking Australian New Zealand assistance as an urgent imperial service to uh, occupy a number of those German uh, territories. The focus for Australia is uh, initially on um, Rabaul before moving north to N Nauru and Yap, um, and for the New Zealanders, it's Samoa. Um, unfortunately, this is bad timing for Australia. We're actually in the midst of a federal election, and uh, in fact, government's been dissolved. Uh, most of the politicians are actually in their constituencies um, uh, uh, campaigning. Um, so there's, there's a, a slight lag between the 6th when the, the telegram is dispatched and the time when Australia actually agrees to take on the task. Because it's a caretaker mode. It's a caretaker mode. Um, and add, the, add to the problems, the, uh, the, uh, the designate Chief of the General Staff, uh, Gordon Legg, he's still on his way back from Australia to take up the position of Chief of the General Staff and it's his prime responsibility for raising this force. Um, he arrives back, um, lands actually in Adelaide, takes the overnight train to Melbourne, uh, gets back there on the 8th, um, and then on the 10th, and uh, in, in given that I pointed out that there's actually no standing contingency plan, he has to basically come up with a concept of operations, a force structure uh, for the land component of the operation, because Patey's already got the, the fleet unit in motion. Um, they decide to, in fact, raise the force in Sydney, um, for a number of reasons. It's the fleet base, uh, and that's where the, the transport HMAS Berrimer is being, uh, is being uh, fitted out by the, uh, by the Navy. Um, and also, it takes the, uh, the centre of attention away from Melbourne, where, in fact, General Bridges is raising the larger 20,000-man Australian Imperial Force. Um, 
I mentioned uh, um, William Holmes is appointed as the commander. He's an army colonel, an army reservist or a militiaman. Uh, quite experienced though, had served in the, uh, in the Boer War, was decorated, uh, was the senior field commander in the second military district, which was New South Wales. So he's probably a good, uh, a good choice for that. But we've just heard Michael say, there's a bunch of plantation owners and some native police. Yes. And Australia's raising this great force to go off to New Guinea. Why were they doing that? It seems to be a mismatch between threat and response. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, it's difficult to know. They had a fairly good idea of, of the number of police. Right. Um, so the intelligence assessments that LEG provides to Holmes says there's about 600 native uh, constabulary. And he should also expect that, in fact, that all German reservists would have been called up. So he is not really aware, in fact, of perhaps the, the, the weakness of this force that he's about to face. So... Um, in addition to that, he's also been told that he's actually got to occupy these territories until he's relieved. So he will need a substantial force to actually do that. Um, they decide upon, or Leg decides in fact, that there'll be, it'll be a three battalion brigade. Um, the, uh, the senior battalion will be a battalion of naval reservists uh, drawn from the naval brigade, which is in, in fact similar to the uh, compulsory service part-time soldiers. These, these are people who uh, complete their compulsory service with the, with the RAN. So how many, how many people are we talking about? For those that don't know, well, yeah. what's a brigade and what's a battalion? What sort of numbers are we looking all up at? The, all up, the brigade is about 2,000 strong um, with the three battalions, but, but they're, they're quite disparate. Um, the naval battalion is about 500 strong. Uh, it's actually, uh, you have to say, uh, it's probably the best trained of the battalions because they're all currently serving reservists. Um, there's a thousand-man army battalion, uh, which is basically made up of uh, some army reservists, but the bulk of them are just civilians who volunteer. Um, and then there's the 3rd Battalion, which is, uh, which is the Kennedy Battalion. Uh, it's raised from volunteers on Thursday Island, uh, who are mostly militiamen or members of rifle clubs, um, and they volunteer to round out and provide the 3rd Battalion. Um, Holmes does a remarkable job. He's given command on the 10th. He has his brigade assembled on Berrima on the 18th, which is um, eight a days. A week, yeah. yeah a that's... week. And, and of people who have not worked in this formation together. Uh, there's obviously a lot of enthusiasm to get amongst it, I suppose. Enormous enthusiasm, but very little skill. Um, now, uh, so what happens is, in fact, um, Berrima uh, is then uh, the, the troops and the sailors board. Uh, the delay, they're delayed slightly from leaving Sydney because uh, they have to wait for orders to arrive from Melbourne. Uh, but they leave on the afternoon of the 19th. They sail up the coastline um, at this stage without escort, um, pause at Brisbane to take on uh, some supplies which are missing uh, and the naval reservists from uh, Brisbane and then sail up the coast and they get to, as far as Palm Island where they're met by Sid HMAS Sydney uh, and commanded by John Glossop. Um, this is where the story diverges slightly. In the meantime, once Patey has finished his job of, uh, of uh, searching Rabaul, um, he's on his way back to... Uh, he moves back to Port Moresby and he's about to recoal and then head off again in search. Uh, he receives admiralty orders saying that in fact he's to cease that and what he's to do now is to escort the um, New Zealand convoy which has to go and take Samoa. So Holmes arrives with Stevenson and, and Glossop and they're up at Thursday Island and so they're actually given a week uh, while um, Patey uh, with Australia and Melbourne uh, complete their task with the New Zealanders. What are they looking for? I mean, they're looking for German warships, German supply ships. What are they, when they're uh, going on this cruise, what are they looking for? Um, primarily, um, Patey's hunting Spay. There's no right. doubt about that. But, and he's hoping to catch Spay over in that direction, but um, he doesn't. So the New, New Zealanders, in fact, complete their task. They land without a shot being fired. And they surrender. Um, so in the meantime, um, Holmes puts his, uh, his raw battalions through a little bit of training on Palm Island off, off uh, Townsville. Um, then he receives instructions from, uh, once Patey's finished his task, RV with me at Russell Island, which is off the uh, eastern coast or the eastern tip of, uh, of um, New Guinea. Um, Glossop takes part of the uh, uh, Berrimah, Sydney and, and some of the other slower vessels, including the submarines. They sail on to Moresby uh, and from there, then they sail towards the rendezvous at Russell Island. Um, one minor incident on the way, um, in Port Moresby, they meet the Kennedy men. This is the third battalion that's supposed to form this, uh, call, this brigade. Call the Kennedy men because... Because they're drawn from the, uh, the northwestern uh, or the, the, the northern districts of uh, Queensland, um, the, the Kennedy region. Basically, the Atherton Table land, uh, area around Townsville and, and Cairns. They're a very rum, rot, rum lot, 
Um, Holmes takes an instant dislike to him as soon as he sees them. Um, but in fact, the, the call, he wants to send them home, but that, no, that's not his call because Patey is an overall command. Uh, Patey advises he would rather keep the 3rd Battalion. Uh, so they do sail all together from Port Moresby, but on the way, uh, the uh, Kanawa, which is the Kennedy Men's Transport, uh, the stokers on that vessel didn't sign up for war, and so they basically strike. And so uh, there's a, uh, a short conference and some uh, radio communications between um, Glossop, Holmes and Patey, and Patey reluctantly agrees to send the Kanawa back to, back to Australia. So they lose that vessel, um, but on the 9th of September, um, Patey um, and Holmes managed to RV at, at Rossell and they sit down and have their first face-to-face -face meeting to discuss the forthcoming operation. So there's no fighting, but it sounds remarkably complicated. Yes, it, it is. Um, and, and I think a lot of this is to do with, in fact, it's just the, the raw nature of the force itself and the lack of any prior planning. Yeah. And Greg Swindon, what actually happens? They, they, I presume they land, there's fighting. Can you take us through just these opening few days of what they encounter when they're there and did it all go to plan? Well, Tom, no plan ever survives first contact with the enemy. We all know that. So the um, ANMEF, Australian uh, Naval and Military Expeditionary Force, arrives uh, off uh, Rabaul on the morning of the 11th of uh, September 1914. Uh, as previously mentioned, uh, the naval uh, element, which was 500 strong, mainly made up of naval reservists from uh, South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland, plus uh, some Royal Australian Navy uh, regulars in certain skills, uh, it's decided they're going to be the first to land. You know, basically, they are naval infantry, they are reasonably well trained, and many of them have worked together before. So uh, the uh, destroyers move in, uh, they're, they're taken off uh, uh, Berrima by uh, three of the destroyers. The destroyers move into, uh, into the harbour. They're also checking to make sure that the area hasn't been mined. Uh, and then a small group of 25 men is landed at Herbertso, and then another 25 men uh, landed at uh, further down the coast at Cabacall. Uh, they're the initial uh, cannon fodder, so to speak, to, to see what the defences are like. And is it night? Is it day? Is it's, it, it's, is it it's, secretive? Is it obvious what they're they've, doing? They've crept into harbour early in the morning, uh, but they've landed uh, probably about you know, 7 o'clock in the morning. So it, it is daylight. Uh, then they don't encounter much at all. Uh, I think the first person they come across is a, a Chinese merchant uh, who's just opening his shop up for the day uh, at Herbertso and uh, you know, basically he's confronted by 25 uh, heavily armed naval personnel. Uh, so at, in the northern portion of the, uh, at Herbertso, the northern portion, it's very quiet. Uh, and so more and more naval personnel start to land. Down at Cabacall, they've landed, uh, nothing much encountered, uh, so the, uh, the officer in charge decides, uh, this is Lieutenant Bowen, decides to, to push in land along the uh, Bitter Parker Road in search of uh, the uh, wireless station, which is one of their main objectives. And as he's starting to make his way along that road, that's when he encounters uh, the first German resistance. And uh, as they're making their way down the road, uh, Able seaman uh, William Williams uh, from Northcote in, in Victoria uh, is the first Australian to encounter the enemy when uh, they open fire and he's quite badly wounded. Uh, Captain uh, Pockley uh, from the Australian Army Medical Corps uh, then comes forward to treat Williams, uh, uh, bandages him up, uh, gets hold of his Red Cross Brassard, gives it to another sailor and says, you know, you know, wear this, this will protect you uh, from enemy fire and ca get Williams back to uh, Berrima uh, to the hospital on board. Uh, so Williams is our first casualty uh, on that day. And how many are there during the day altogether? All, altogether six personnel are killed uh, during that day or die, die from their wounds. Uh, unfortunately, Pockley, uh, uh, shortly after treating Williams, he's continuing to move forward and uh, he's shot as well. Uh, he didn't have his Red Cross brassard on. Uh, no so he's fair game. He's fair game. Uh, so he's also badly wounded and taken back to, to Berrima. And regrettably, later in the day, both Pockley and Williams, Williams die. There is some conjecture as to uh, whether Williams is really the first fatal casualty uh, 
of the war because uh, as they continue to push uh, inland, uh, able seaman uh, uh, John Walker, who served under the surname Courtney, is uh, shot and killed outright. So there are some who say that uh, Walker is the first actual death uh, because even though Williams was first hit, it took him some time, unfortunately, to die. I suppose they're all dead. So they're all dead. Dies yeah. first. But yeah. it's interesting, though, that people do think that's important because it marks, I suppose, for the Navy, a wartime loss, doesn't it? It certainly does. And what about it not going to plan? What was, the, if you like, the, the, the greatest failure or the, uh, the most unexpected element of what happened on that landing? Well, the German resistance uh, was was much more than they expected. Uh, as uh, the firing started, uh, there were a number of German officers uh, controlling Melanesian troops. Uh, the country was pretty hard going. Yes, there was a road, a dirt road, taking them along to uh, the Bitter Park uh, wireless station, but it was just jungle on either side. And uh, a number of trenches have been dug across the road, uh, a number of uh, pipe mines, uh, large pipes had been laid as mines. Uh, and as they were making their way forward, uh, there was uh, a fair bit of fighting occurring. Uh, Petty Officer Palmer uh, was the first one to uh, open fire on the, on the enemy when he wounded a German uh, soldier who was then captured. And that was the, the first prisoner of war taken in World War I was captured by that, uh, those troops. And how many Germans were killed and how many were taken prison? Do we know the numbers? Uh, uh, approximately 30 Melanesian troops were, were killed. Um, one, one German officer was killed. Uh, the number of Melanesian troops who were taken as prisoner is, uh, is not quite known, but well over 100, and approximately 30 or so uh, German reservists were taken prisoner. The fighting was very confused, and there's, uh, there's some claims which are, are not uh, uh, unrealistic which is that some of the Australian wounded and some of the Australian uh, dead may have actually been uh, a blue on blue where uh, basically the Australians were firing at what they thought they were Germans, but in fact they were Australians who were conducting a, a, a pincer manoeuvre or trying to work their way around the German position and just got in the line of fire. So they captured the wireless station, they occupied the territory, in that sense mission accomplished? It, by the end of the, d the first day, uh, the bulk of the fighting was over. They had pushed through. Uh, they had captured the, the wireless station at Bitter Parker right towards uh, dusk on, on the 11th. Uh, and this is where um, Lieutenant Bond, who's one of the uh, naval officers with the, uh, uh, the expedition. Uh, His name wasn't James Bond. Please tell me. No, no, it was, James Bond. it was Thomas Bond. <laughs> Thomas Bond. Uh, an accountant from Brisbane, uh, but uh, he distinguished himself uh, particularly. Uh, particularly noteworthy actions uh, when, uh, you know, along with him was only two other personnel, he rushed forward and disarmed eight German soldiers who were about to launch an attack uh, and then pushed forward, uh, captured more German soldiers and was led the first party to capture Bitter Parker. And he was later awarded uh, a Distinguished Service Order, which was the first award to Australia and the first award to the RAN in the First World War. So we've got a number of firsts. We've got the first prisoner of war taken. We've got the first, first men killed, uh, the first awards uh, made, uh, all to the, um, the, the naval element of the, uh, of the expeditionary force. Yeah, some, some things you'd be pleased about and some things less so. Yeah. Rob, how did it look from the Army's perspective? Um, well, actually, the point I was going to make just on that, Tom, is sometimes the planned people, when they, they look at this, they say, well, why, if they were expecting German resistance, why did they only send two small naval parties ashore initially? It's almost been thrown to the wolves. And it was only when I was doing some, uh, some research in, in the archives, and I actually came across um, some of the planning documents that um, Patey and, uh, and Holmes conducted. Holmes conducted an appreciation of the situation before he actually developed his plan. And basically, both he and Patey um, thought they weren't going to face any resistance at all. They believed the Germans would surrender. And this was based on the premise that uh, Patey had already been to Rabaul once and, and was not opposed. The Germans had automatically surrendered at Samoa to the New Zealanders where they shot being fired. Therefore? Therefore, mm. it seemed logical that, in fact, that they, they would not. Um, it was just unfortunate that Captain von Klewitz, who was the German commander, um, he was probably made of stauncher stuff, and, uh, and so they decided to actually fight it out. And in some cases, I mean, the, the preparations um, 
were actually quite thorough uh, with mines and, 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 and entrenchments. And it's surprising, in fact, Australian casualties weren't even higher. Mm. And I think we can put that down to, in fact, to the, the training of the, na the naval uh, officers and, and, the, uh, and the, um, the tactics they employed, mm. uh, avoiding the, the fire lane of the road and manoeuvring through the jungle. So I think the first time jungle fighters, they actually did quite well. Mm. Michael, how did it seem to the Germans to see this naval parties and others coming? How did it seem to them and what was their experience? Well, well I've, I have nothing to add to the description of these events here, but from the German point of view, it is really interesting to see how this really inexperienced uh, troops were able to put up these very clever defense systems, uh, digging by digging trenches, hiding uh, snipers in the trees, uh, in the jungle, and also building pipelines which could have had a uh, disastrous impact uh, upon uh, an attacking force and uh, that they were eventually even able to uh, inflict heavy losses uh, upon the, the Australian troops uh, which tried to attack them. And this is what, what I find interesting. What is also interesting to note is the fact that the Germans were uh, very well aware of the fact because they had um, outlooks uh, on the seaside uh, trying to find out what was going to happen uh, and uh, reporting it to von Klebitz. And uh, so uh, they did what they could. And this is something which I find remarkable, though this had regarded what was happening on the Western Front that, or even on the Eastern Front at that time, this was really even less than a minor incident in, 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 in a really great war. It's a, look, for the, for the Germans, is this a footnote? Is it as much a footnote? It's, it's even less than a footnote. <laughs> less than a footnote. <laughs> because it was a defeat or because it was just so small? It was so small and, and, and really completely unimportant. Yeah. Peter Briggs, can I ask you, we, when we think of Rebel and this campaign, we do think of AE1. Can you tell us about her role and uh, what happened leading up to her disappearance? Yes, uh, AE1 and AE2 were used with a, a consort, one of the destroyers, to protect the southern approaches coming up St George Channel. And Yarra and AE2 had done the patrol on the 13th without any incident. Uh, Parramatta and AE1 were detailed off to do the same thing on the, the 14th. AE1 sailed from the uh, fleet at Anchorage up in uh, the harbour in Rabaul at 7 a.m., uh, requested permission to proceed and got an approval from the Admiral with a, the additional direction that he was to be, to be sure to be back by dark, which was 1750. Uh, he met up, rendezvoused with Parramatta off Herbert Show, where she had been anchored overnight, and they proceeded in, in company down towards the east, towards Cape Gazelle. Um, we have we rely on Parramatta's account of the day. He was uh, directed to provide a report, and, and we have the original of that uh, in, still in the archives. Uh, there was a, a disjointed exchange between the two of them as they went down. Uh, AE1 was the senior ship of the two and should have taken charge, uh, but didn't do so. Uh, at 9 o'clock off Cape Brazil itself, uh, AE1 turned to the northeast towards the Duke of York Islands, leaving Parramatta to go down and patrol uh, further to the southeast uh, as directed in the approaches to St George's Channel. Uh, I believe, looking at the, at the dialogue reported by Parramatta, that we're only getting part of the story. And I think uh, there is an agreement which is unstated or not reported between them that A1 will head up to the Duke of York Islands and see if they can find a steamer that was seen the night before by Yarra. Um, and indeed, I believe they had a rendezvous arranged at 2.30 that afternoon, which is the next occasion. In Parramatta's report, he left his patrol line at 12.30, steamed in a straight line, and at 2.30 he was close to the submarine, uh, close in off the Duke of York Islands. That's the last uh, sighting of, of AE1 we have. Parramatta said he opened out to the east and by 3.20 he had lost sight of the submarine. It was hazy, visibility no better than five nautical miles. He assumed AE1 was heading back to harbour uh, as he would have had to do to be back by sunset and Parramatta himself uh, circumnavigated 
Institute of York to the, uh, the north and went back to his anchorage off Herbert Show. It wasn't until 2015 that evening that AE2 raised the alarm that AE1 had not returned to harbour. They were waiting with spare parts and uh, technicians to fix the defect on AE1 and uh, by 2015 they were uh, concerned that she hadn't returned. And then the process of, of uh, investigation and finally ordering a search uh, got underway later that evening. Uh, and we think, it, it, I mean, this is all surmise, but uh, we've been over all the original uh, uh, records in the archives, team of naval historians, submariners uh, and engineers to ponder what could have gone wrong with AE1. Uh, our surmise is that she endeavoured a practice dive on the return trip and that that went wrong and the submarine flooded and uh, ended up on the bottom quite quickly, probably about four, between four and uh, four thirty. And she's not been seen since? Uh, no, there were no, uh, there was no wreckage, uh, no significant oil slicks or debris fields, uh, no bodies. Uh, hence the conclusion that the submarine is basically intact. If it had been uh, crushed in a diving accident, it would have had quite widespread oil and debris fields. Um, there were no distress messages, but we wouldn't have expected that. She would have been cleared for, for action, and so her wireless mask, which is a large temporary wooden affair, uh, would have been struck before she sailed from harbour, so she would have been ready to die if she'd met the enemy. Um, so she was quite limited in her ability to, uh, to communicate. And indeed, the, mess the exchanges reported by Parramatta were not heard by any other ships on the radio circuit, uh, as we would expect. So they're probably conducted by megaphone, uh, possibly by flashing uh, Alder Slight, but megaphone most likely. And Rob Stevenson, can I ask you, what was the, if for the Germans this is less than a footnote, what is the strategic significance of Rabaul for the Allied side and for the position of the British Empire in the Pacific? Um, I'd have to say, Tom, the short answer is uh, absolutely nothing. Um, it, this is a sideshow. It was always going to be a sideshow. Um, the fact that uh, Australia, New Zealand, and when Japan enters the war in, on the 24th of August on the side of Britain, uh, it besieges the, Japan, the uh, German naval base at Zingtao, or Kwando today, um, and that, after a brief siege, that collapses. Um, Germany loses all its territories here, but, but to be honest, they're actually they're not, they're not significant. At the same time as the Australian uh, sailor soldiers are fighting it out at Rabaul, um, and that's a couple of hundred of them, um, about a million troops in France uh, are fighting the Battle of the Marne. Um, the fact that the French are able to stem the German invasion of France uh, means that the war will now become a, uh, a war of attrition. It will drag on for another four years. Um, and in all of this, um, uh, the Pacific is, 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 a, is a, a, minor, a minor distraction. Um, but I should say that there is, there is I suppose, uh, if you like historical what-ifs, there is the opportunity here that um, if you compare what happened in some of other G Germany's other colonies, particularly East Africa with Lieutenant Colonel Paul uh, Littel Vorbeck, um, he manages, in fact, to sustain quite a, a plucky defence of that colony um, for right until after the armistice. Ties down about 200,000 South African troops. Um, there is the possibility that perhaps um, a similar um, guerrilla campaign could have been waged in Rabaul, although um, Klevitz's, uh, von Klevitz's uh, resources are much smaller. Um, but even if he had have been able to do that and they had have extended resistance, the reality is the op was only going to end in one way. But it may well have perhaps distracted Australia a little bit more than sending troops to Europe. That, that's perhaps one outcome. But, but in the grand scheme of the Great War, um, the Pacific is, uh, is just a minor operation. So there's some, though, institutional learning about doing joint operations. That comes, or is that pretty minor too? It's very minor. Uh, even the fact that we operate in, the, because the, the, the Australian garrison remains in New Guinea for another five years. Um, even things such as learning uh, the, the problems of how to deal with malaria, um, we very quickly forget that. And we act, in fact, when we go back in 1942, we have exactly the same problems uh, reoccur. Um, so I think, unfortunately, yeah, the institutional learnings uh, for the RAN and for the Army uh, were, were quite short-term. Yeah. Um, 
Greg Swinton, um, I know in a few ships, the Battle Honours, it has Rebel 1914. How does it sit in naval history, this particular campaign? Well, it was, in many respects, as previously mentioned, a sideshow. Uh, certainly, it wasn't all that important uh, in 1914. Uh, the Navy moved on to other jobs, you know, hunting Von Spey uh, with HMAS Australia, you know, the Sydney Emden action, AE2 in the, uh, the Dardanelles, uh, and etc. You know, the torpedo boat destroyers, Mediterranean, North Sea Fleet, etc. So it was it was very quickly forgotten. It's been only probably in the last 10 years that the Navy has rediscovered uh, much of its history. Uh, and, and in fact, the Rabaul Battle Honour, uh, even though HMAS Australia wore it unofficially, was not actually uh, conferred until you know, 2010. So a number Why was that? Because it was thought to be minor or not a discrete operation? Uh, it was thought to be minor. Yeah. Uh, and so. Uh, the Navy has rediscovered a lot of its history in the last 10 to 20 years uh, and looking at you know, what did we actually do? Was it important? Uh, in the grand scheme of things, the Rebel uh, activity was a sideshow, but it was our first time to war as the Royal Australian Navy. Uh, you know, despite the casualties, it was a success. Uh, German New Guinea was captured. Uh, casualties were light in comparison to the number of uh, men who were contributed. and. It, you know, a number of firsts, the first deaths, the first, uh, first honours uh, awarded, uh, the first prisoners of war taken. Now I've been to Rebel, I went there about 25 years ago, it's a wonderful deep water <coughs> harbour, just a fantastic kind of place. Did it help the Navy get better acquainted with that part of Papua New Guinea and did that help in the Second World War at all? Certainly um, naval personnel stayed on as part of the, uh, uh, the occupation force and uh, their portion was withdrawn in, uh, in February of 1915. But a large number of naval personnel did stay in that area, particularly as part of uh, the, the RAN wireless uh, or radio service operating the wireless sets for communication across that vast area of New Britain, New Ireland and the north coast of New Guinea. So much of what was done then did have an impact later during World War II because the RAN had remained involved in that area uh, and certainly the coast watching organisation that uh, grew during 1942 had a lot to thank the Navy for its work that had done during World War I mm. in that area. And Michael, what happened to the Germans who were uh, on New Britain? What, what was their fate? Were they sent home? Did they stay prisoners? And did any remain in the area after the end of the Great War? Well, if you compare it with the armistice and the Treaty of Versailles, the German the governor, Edward Harbour, was uh, able to negotiate a very fair surrender with uh, the Australians, and they granted it. And uh, those officials who wanted to go home were allowed to go home, and uh, they eventually arrived in, in, in Germany in 1915 uh, uh, via the United States. Um, and others had to swear, those who wanted to stay, they had to, to swear an, an oath of neutrality, and they could stay. Uh, the, go on their business uh, as though nothing had happened. They were still owners of their, own, their plantations and some of them stayed, uh, whereas others left after uh, the end of the war because it didn't make sense to stay there. But some st did actually stay there uh, for some time uh, and that was it. And this particular episode, is it known much in Germany or in German naval history? Or is it only really specialists like yourself that are familiar with what occurred? Well, we have only one. It's interesting that we have only one specialist, uh, one historian. It's, it's Hermann Josef Hiri, uh, who knows a lot about this area. He has written this important book on uh, the neglected war in the Pacific, which, interestingly enough, uh, was written in English and only very few specialists in Germany know. What we know about is, of course, the German East Asia Squadron. This is interesting because this, the name von, Sp von Spee is uh, legendary, legendary yeah. in Germany. And uh, this uh, cruise from uh, Tsingdao uh, uh, via, the Cor uh, Cor via Coronel and the Falklands is, of course, uh, of some importance because it had an important impact upon uh, uh, German naval strategy in, in, in World War II. And what is also, of course, well known is uh, the fate of the Emden. These are the things we know about. Uh, the rest is simply forgotten. It has some romantic value because uh, 
whether, wherever you go, uh, the German Naval Museum in Wilhelmshaven or the, the uh, Naval Museum at the German uh, Naval Academy in, in Flensburg, they still have many uh, photographs of uh, German uh, sailors here in the Pacific with, of course, uh, beautiful natives and, uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, this is a little bit, uh, this is the romantic spell of the area here. It's exotic. Uh, uh, yeah. The exotic spell, well, that is all. Yeah. Well, look, let's hope this podcast turns that around and it does become better known. Gentlemen, thank you all for your time. That's all we've got time for with this podcast. Uh, my thanks to uh, our guests today, uh, to Michael, to Rob, to Greg and to Peter Briggs. Uh, we've enjoyed many great insights on this campaign. We do hope that you've enjoyed this podcast. We look forward to you joining us next time. Goodbye for now.